Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning message. We hope this finds you all doing well. Been praying for you, and again, thank you for joining with us today as we continue our study in the book of Daniel. God's power and authority are limitless. We all know that. By the word of his mouth, everything in existence came to exist. That's why God is called sovereign. He is all-powerful and all authority over all his creation. Because God is sovereign, he can do anything he so desires, anything he wants to do, and no one, no human can hinder him or call him into accountability. You've heard it said that people says that they're, he's their, his own boss or she's her own boss. Don't believe that. There's only one whom such a statement can be made of, and that is sovereign God, who has authority over all his creation, including his supreme creation, man. Our problem has been, since the Garden of Eden, is that the heart of sinful man is rebellious at the very idea of a sovereign God, for the human heart's desire is to be free from any outside control. <clears throat> a worldly sinner may think that he's free, but the real truth is the sinner doesn't realize what kind of prison he is actually in because of the power of Satan ruling his life and his own sinful nature. Charles Spurgeon said, Most men quarrel with the sovereignty of God, but mark this, the thing you complain of in God is the very thing that you love in yourselves. Every man, every human, likes to feel that he has the right to do with his own as he pleases. We all like to be little sovereigns, Spurgeon said. But listen at this closing remark in his statement. Oh, for a spirit that bows always before the sovereignty of of God. That should be our desire, is to be submissive to the Lord God and not to want to be the little sovereigns, but allow him to be sovereign over all of our life. Because our God is so powerful and knowledgeable, he has permitted us as mankind to make our own decisions and to decide to even disobey his revealed will that he gives us through his word. And yet, he accomplishes the divine purpose or his divine purpose on this earth. I believe we see the hand of sovereign God moving in our world right now. And mankind should humble itself as we see his purposes unfold. Nebuchadnezzar, as we've seen in the past weeks, had a big problem with humbling himself. That powerful, proud king had come into Jerusalem and destroyed it and had taken many of the people captive and exiled them back to Babylon. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in that number. But God was with these Hebrew boys, as we've seen. And because of their unwavering faith in the Lord and by God's sovereignty, these four men were given some very supernatural powers. Daniel told and interpreted the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And because Daniel gave all the praise and glory to God for revealing the king's dream to him, Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself before the Lord and made Daniel part of the king's officials, didn't he? Nebuchadnezzar's humility lasted for a while, but then, as you recall, pride took over again. He erected a 90-foot-tall, gold-laden statue in honor of himself and made a decree that when the people of the land heard the music from many instruments, they were to bow down and worship this image, this statue. And if they didn't, the decree called for those who wouldn't obey to be thrown into a burning fiery furnace. The three faithful Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't bend. They wouldn't bow. And they wouldn't burn. 
For you see, when Nebuchadnezzar had had them thrown into that fiery furnace, the king saw that there was another in the fire as well, a fourth man walking in the flames that he described as looking like the Son of God. And my friends, it was. And the Lord saved those boys from the flames, didn't he? Those three Hebrew boys came out of that fire unheard and not even smelling like smoke. At that, Nebuchadnezzar spoke of and blessed the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has saved his servants that trusted him. Then the king, you recall, made another decree saying that any people or nation or language that spoke anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be cut in pieces and their houses would be made into a latrine. The king promoted the three Hebrew boys to a higher place in his regime. You would think, just giving this some thought this week, you would think that after seeing Daniel tell him his dream and interpreting it, that Nebuchadnezzar would have stayed with the Lord. But he didn't. You would think that after seeing the Lord miraculously deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, the king would have stayed with God. But he didn't. You would think that the children of Israel would have stayed with the Lord after seeing the Red Sea part and allowing them to go across on dry land. But they didn't. You would think that a nation as blessed as the United States of America has been would honor the living God of the Bible. But as a nation, we continue to slip away from the Lord. You would think that people in our day and in days prior to ours saw God bring them through some tragedy or serious illness would turn their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. But many times they don't. Nebuchadnezzar was a perfect example of this very thing. And the reason for it is what we talked about earlier. The heart of sinful man is rebellious at the very idea of a sovereign God. For the human heart's desire is to be free from all outside control. My friends, we're not free from the control of God. We belong to Him. He is our owner. Paul said he was a bond slave to the Lord. So are we. Whether we like to admit that or not, whether the world likes to admit that or not, God owns us. And he owns everything that we think we own. It's all his, isn't it? Now, we lead up to what Nebuchadnezzar has been doing with his life and the lives of these Hebrew boys. Today we look at chapter 4 of the book of Daniel. We see that King Nebuchadnezzar has had another dream. We'll see that his astrologers and soothsayers and magicians could not interpret the dream. And we'll see that once again that God gives Daniel the interpretation. We'll also see pride once again get the best of old King Nebuchadnezzar. But this time the Lord's judgment upon him is severe. But always remember, dear church, dear person listening to this, even in God's judgments of sinful man, he's still full of mercy and grace. Praise the Lord today. He spares Nebuchadnezzar. Then ending, the ending of this story is an awesome picture of what a true repentant heart looks like and the blessings the Lord brings to a heart that seeks God and is repentant. In Daniel chapter 4, beginning with verse 4, I'm going to read some verses here, and this will tell you of this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has had. Beginning with verse 4, again, thank you for being with us today. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was set at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. 
and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore I made a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told them the dream, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Oh, but here's God's man. Verse 8. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, or Daniel, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. It was a big, huge tree. Verse 11, the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached into heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beast of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelled in the boughs thereof, and all flesh fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even when a band of even with a band of iron and brass, in a tender in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. This dream I Nebuchadnezzar have seen now thou, O Belteshazzar, Daniel, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all these wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. We notice that Nebuchadnezzar continues to, continues to say the spirit of the holy gods. He had not fully understood there is but one God. But he will. But he will. So we see the description of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream as he, as he tells it himself. Another dream, just as his first one, that troubled him greatly. Now I want you to notice back in verse 4 for a moment what Nebuchadnezzar was doing. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. You know, that's the way life is sometimes, isn't it? Things are going great. We're at rest and peace and life is good. We're flourishing. Then suddenly something comes into our lives to disturb us. And it can be any number of things that keeps us from rest and our minds at ease. You've heard me say this before. When life is easy, it's easy to forget God, isn't it? We get to thinking everything is going good. First thing, if we're not careful though, We'll begin to get away from the Lord a little, won't we? We're not reading our Bible as much as we used to, and prayer becomes just an occasional thing. Friends, God doesn't want us in that spiritual condition at all. So many times he will begin to allow things to come into our lives to disturb us enough to once again see our desperate need of a loving Heavenly Father 
God was about to get the king's attention in a very severe way. Now here's Daniel's interpretation of the dream as we read on in this marvelous section of scripture. Beginning with verse 19 of chapter 4 of Daniel, the Bible says this, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. His thoughts troubled him in that he knew what the dream meant, and he didn't want to see Nebuchadnezzar have to go through this, but he knew God's will would be done. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. He's saying, I'd rather that be on your enemies than on you. That's what he's saying. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached into heaven, and the sight thereof to uh, all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beast of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the, fields, uh, the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. Here's the answer. It is you. It's, it is thou, O king. The tree is you that, that art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the field, till seven times pass over him." seven years this is the interpretation O king and this is the decree of the most high this is God's word is what Daniel is telling him, which has come upon my lord the king that they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field and they shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the Most High, why is this going on? So that you're going to know, Nebuchadnezzar, that thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. He's saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you have your power because God gave it to you. Friends, that's our lives. We can do nothing apart from God allowing us to have what we have, the knowledge we have, the stuff we have, and everything else is all from God. Verse 26, and whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree uh, of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. It's going to be faithful to you. After that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to thee. Listen to what I'm telling you. This is the interpretation, and now I'm going to give you counsel. And break off thy sins by what? Righteousness. Replace your wickedness with righteousness, Nebuchadnezzar, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Give to the poor. Care for your neighbor, Nebuchadnezzar. If it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. You're flourishing, you're at rest in your palace. Maybe if you'll turn from your sin, God would give you easier days, or more of them anyway. So what's going on here? Well, what's happening is that God, by revealing the king's dream through Daniel, is warning Nebuchadnezzar of what is going to come and what the king might do to find mercy in the eyes of the Lord. Look at verse 27 again. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. That's what Daniel wants for the king. You can be easier in your life if you'll repent of your sins and turn to God. But does the proud king take to heart what has been told him? No, no. He does not. He is still saturated 
with pride, isn't he? All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 28. And at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake, listen to these words, and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Oh my, he's just dripping wet with pride, isn't he? You know, God was merciful. He's merciful to us, church. He's merciful to mankind. But God was merciful merciful, and had given Nebuchadnezzar 12 months to repent by showing mercy to the poor. But he would not. So what happens? Verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, this verse 30 was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass with the oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. Just as Daniel had interpreted the king's dream, it happened. What an awful seven years Nebuchadnezzar had to spend because of his rebellion against the power of God. But friends, hear this. God's grace is amazing, and when the Lord sees a man broken because of his sin, and he sees the heart of that man in the state of, a, of genuine repentance, God shall show forth his forgiveness and mercy. Hallelujah this morning. Verse 34, And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, now this is the king talking, he's giving testimony of what went on. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding, returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, listen to this testimony, friends, of a true repentant heart, Praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to obey. Nebuchadnezzar's hard, evil, proud heart was changed, wasn't it? Why do I say that? Well, look again at the last part of the verse I just read to you. And those that walk in pride, which I've done, that's what Nebuchadnezzar was saying. I walked in pride. He is able to to abase or put down. He realized that God had brought him down and he finally acknowledges that God is the true king and Nebuchadnezzar is not. What a lesson in humility for all of us. What a lesson of God's judgment. What a lesson of God's mercy and grace. The heart of a powerful, wicked king had been changed. How do I know that? Well, let's go back to the first three verses of this chapter as Nebuchadnezzar starts his, his speech here. Verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king and to all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. What does he say? Oh, this is Nebuchadnezzar. Peace be multiplied unto you. This was a conquering king, an evil king who had gone in and killed people and, and ravaged their land. But now he's saying, peace be multiplied unto you. 
I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. This was the beginning of what we've been studying today. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. It's a sad thing that Nebuchadnezzar had to endure God's judgment before he would acknowledge the Lord as who he is. But after he did see that he was nothing compared to God, he repented and notice how the story ends. God restored his kingdom to him. The world today doesn't think pride is a wicked and dangerous sin. We see it everywhere, don't we? But it truly is. It's dangerous. Many times pride drives hearts of powerful men to the point that they are truly dangerous and make wicked decisions. May we all pray the prayer of Spurgeon. Oh, for a spirit that bows always before the sovereignty of God. Nebuchadnezzar found that spirit, didn't he? Well, thank you for being with us today, and God bless each of you until we speak again.